Hello. I'd first like to thank um, Lita for inviting me to talk, and I'd like to thank all the organisers for giving me this opportunity. Um, so, diet microbiota interactions and the elderly. So you've um, so why look to microbiota? So David Relman gave you these figures already, but these are these are good figures. So I don't think there's any harm going through them again. So, ten times the number of cells in our body um, are bacteria to human. And these contain 150 times the number of, bacteri of bacterial genes to human genes. And so this may not be a one-to-one -one ratio because of splice variants and whatever, but this is still a huge number. And if you think of genes as function, then these bacteria perform an awful lot of beneficial functions um, throughout the adult life. And these populations are relatively stable um, in the, in the adults, um, and they perform, they are involved in the absorption of minerals, the utilization of nutrients um, from our food, they um, interact with um, the immunomodulatory effects, uh, the production of substrates, and even the regulation of insulin sensitivity and uh, appetite control through the uh, free fatty acid receptors two and three. And so variations in these populations have been, have been associated to a number of disorders, including irritable bowel syndrome, IBD, um, like ulcerative colitis, and obesity. So why look at the gut microbiota in the elderly? Well, um, first of all, the elderly are an increasing proportion of our society. This is a wonderful success of mod modern medicine, but it comes with its own challenges. This, this cohort of our society <coughs> have an increased susceptibility to infection. And so C. difficile infection is a big problem in residential care. And they also have this sort of systematic um, uh, um, increased um, inflammatory status. Uh, we refer to as inflammation aging. And, um, but the, one of the best reasons for looking at the microbiota in the elderly is because there are changes in the microbiota composition and activity in this elderly population. It remains stable for the adult life, and then as people, um, and then as people get older, it begins to change. And so, um, last but not least, there's the, there's the prospect of dietary modulation of these um, organisms um, to improve um, health of this cohort of people. So to look at this, we need a data set. And the data set we use consists of 178 elderly individuals and 13 young controls. The largest um, group in this data set are the community dwelling individuals but we also have 75 people in residential care. We divided these into two groups, um, individuals who had been in residential care for longer than six weeks, we refer to these as long stay, and less than six weeks, and we refer to these as um, rehabilitation. Within the people who live in community, we have 20 day hospital um, individuals who, um, who attend outpatient care. And for these individuals, we have a number of data sets. The primary data set is a 16S ribosomal DNA Amplicon data set um, that measures the taxonomic um, composition for the individual um, subjects. But we also have a shotgun um, um, data set based on Illumina sequencing, a metabolomics data set, and we have dietary data for 168 of our um, 178 elderly individuals. So um, I'm by petition. When I get a data set, I want to visualize it. So we have 5.4 million 16S reads. We clustered these into 47.5 OTUs. Uh, my favorite definition of an OTU is an operational taxonomic unit. It's my favorite de definition because it tells you absolutely nothing at all. The, um, so OTUs are just um, reads clustered by similarity 
um, in this case 3%, and they, they generally correspond to either genera, species, or genus level taxa. And so um, we can get this, we can see the, o, the OTU composition for each individual person, and using this information, we can generate unifract distances and visualize the data set. So this is a multivariate plot of the data set. So the, oh, the green samples here are our community samples, and the red up here are our long-stay long individuals. And as you can see, there's quite a good separation between the people living in the community and the people living in long-stay based on their, mic and their microbial composition. The young controls here in purple cluster with the community, and we have individuals in day hospital and rehab who sort of form these intermediate groups. We can visualize this data a second way um, using one of these um, heat plots. Um, just generally, red is there, blue is absent. Um, along the top here, we have the samples, colored the same as before, red being the long state individuals and green being the community. And as you can see, based on this hierarchical tree, this is the strongest split in the data set. Along the side here, we have the OTUs. These are clustered. They are also color coded um, at the family and phylum level. The phylum level color coding is blue for bacteroides, um, brown for firmicutes. And so what we can see is a couple of things. So first of all, there's this, um, a number of taxa are increased in the long state individuals. And we're, we also see a number of taxa that are lost in the long state individuals compared to the community um, samples. Um, we can see here that there are some clusters that, are, that have lost more uh, microbial taxa than others. And so we can further divide this tree based on a particular height um, into eight groups. Um, these are not distinct groups, they're just overlapping clusters. And we can take this information and overlay it back on the previous multivariate plot. And what we can see is that, the, that these eight clusters um, separate spatially along the plot, with these clusters over here being associated with long stay, and these clusters over here being associated with the community samples. Um, so we also have food data. This food data comes in the form of fruit, fruit frequency questionnaires. So these measure long-term dietary effects. And we have this information for um, the majority of our subjects. And it consists of 147 food types um, that, were, um, that are representative of the Irish diet. <coughs> and these have previously been um, validated in uh, previous studies. And we also generated um, what is known as the Healthy Food Diversity Index. And this pretty much does exactly what it says on the tin. It measures how diverse and healthy your diet is. Um, each individual food is given a health value, um, 0 0.268 for fruit and veg, and 0 0.0001 for lard. So if you, and this is multiplied up by like the diversity of the diet. And, and so um, if you have a diverse diet of fruit and veg, you get a very high value. If you have a low diversity diet of mainly animal products, you get a very low value. And we can visualize this fruit frequency data using um, multivariate analysis. Um, similar to before, um, you've got your samples up here at the top. Um, we use correspondence. This has the advantage you can also visualize the um, variables. And so up here at the top, you have the samples. Our community samples are in green, and our long-stay samples are in red. Very similar to the microbiota, very good split. Down here, the foods are color-coded. Green is fruit and veg. And as you can see, it's skewed off towards the community. Brown is meat, skewed off towards the long stay, as is blue, which is high sugar, high fat foods. So generally, the community eat more fruit and veg, long stay eat more meat and high fat, high sugar foods. Again, we can visualize this with a heat plot. Uh, the reason for doing this is, again, to look at the sort of diversity. We can see that there's a large number of foods here that are just not eaten in um, the long-term residential care, and a lot of these are fruit and veg. Um, 
There are a number of foods that have reduced consumption in residential care, and there is and there are a number of foods that have increased consumption. So the people in um, residential care generally have a much um, less diverse diet than people in the community. And um, we can, as we can see the same um, trends in both data sets, we can use a thing called Procrustes analyses to view both data sets together. And so all this really does is it takes um, the two data sets that are both sort of in multi-dimensional space and it twists them in this multi-dimensional space to get the most covariance between the two data sets. And in this way, we're able to um, visualize both the diet and the microbiota data set on the same plot, where the diet is at the end with the dot in it, and the microbiota is at the far end. <coughs> and so what we can see, so if we zoom in on the, if we zoom in on the individuals that live in the community, what we can see is that individuals who have this type of diet have a corresponding type of microbiota, and individuals who have this type of diet have a corresponding type of microbiota. Uh, this is this is unweighted unifrac. This is weighted unifrac, and um, and so up here we have our more of our prevotella associated microbiota. Down here, it's our bacteroides associated uh, microbiota. As people enter um, residential care, their diet starts to change, and after six weeks, this is six weeks to a year, their diet is recognisably that. As a, as a person in residential care. And after about a year, the microbiota follows suit, and it is sort of recognizably the, um, the microbiota of individuals um, in residential care. Um, so the, the diet changes first, the microbiota then follows over the course of the year. So the diversity of the microbiota and the diet. So we, down here, we have phylogenetic diversity, which is a measure of the microbial diversity in the data set. And these are our four diet groups. Um, did I forget to mention four diet groups? Um, the four diet groups come from, uh, the four diet groups come from this um, hierarchical tree, um, where we, again, split it just into four. And the diet group one can be described as low fat, high fiber. Diet group two can be described as moderate fat and fiber. Diet group three can be described as moderate fat, low fiber. And diet group four can be described as high fat, moderate fiber. Um, and so across these um, diet groups, you can see there is a decrease in food, uh, healthy food diversity um, in, in, from the community down into the residential care. And we can see an associated decrease in the microbial diversity um, from diet group one down to diet group three. Um, there's a small um, increase between diet group four and diet group three in the microbial diversity. This isn't significant, but I still think it's um, quite interesting because there is um, an increased consumption of, a small increase of consumption of fiber in diet group four, even though there's no increase in the actual healthy food diversity. Um, of this group, and so this is reflected in a small increase in microbial diversity. Um, but overall, there is a very good correlation between um, microbial diversity and um, healthy food diversity uh, within this data set. So a more diverse diet leads to a more diverse microbiota. We also have metabolomics data set. So these are two multivariate plots where we separate, where we can see there's a separation between community and long stay, and we can, and community and rehab. And um, we, and so how does this uh, relate to the microbiota, microbiota? So there's a method that is similar to Procrustes analysis um, called co uh, inertia analysis. And so this allows us to visualize the samples and the variables at the same time. So if we just look at the top two panels, um, so the first panel on the left, and these are the samples, same as before. Um, one side is the, the, the start of the arrow is the, is the metabolites. The end of the arrow is the microbiota. 
And you can see that the green community samples separate out from the red um, long stay samples. And this separation is associated with um, particularly butyrate and acetate, but also propanate, valerate, and glutarate. So the short chain, there's a reduction in the production of short chain fatty acids within the um, residential care individuals. And this is associated with a number of microbial changes represented here by the genus level. And we can see our bacteroides, um, ruminococcus, coprococcus, um, oscillobacter, um, among um, other genera that are, that are more associated with the community than they are with the long stay. And with the long stay, you have uh, the most associated genera is the parabacteroids. <clears throat> so to generate short chain fatty acids, you need the substrate, i.e. fiber, and you also um, need the microbial functionality. And so is it a, is it a question that this is just the reduced fiber at least to reduce short chain fatty acid production? Um, but we also see a reduction in market genes for the production of butyrate and acetate um, and propanate. So for a butyrate and acetate, uh, this reduction is significant. Um, for propanate, it's just a trend, but this makes sense based on the previous plot where um, the butyrate and acetate, acetate were uh, much more strongly associated with the, with the community than propanate. We also have a number of measures of the health of these elderly individuals. Um, we measure, we use FIM and Bartel to measure frailty. Um, um, we have information on cognitive decline in the mini mental state exam, and um, and we have information geriatric depression and nutrition and calf circumference, which is a mid arm circumference, which is a measure of sarcopenia. And we removed possible um, confounders. We removed individuals who had used, um, who had been given antibiotics within the previous month. And we also, um, we also, in our statistical model, we adjusted for age, gender, location, and medication. So to correlate these clinical variables with the microbial populations, we correlated them with the two strongest trends in the data set as defined by the multivariate analysis. And so we correlate the clinical variables with the trend going this way and the trend going this way. So this trend is from the community to the long state type microbiota. And this trend here is more the high diversity microbiota to the lower diversity microbiota. And interestingly, we see um, IL-6 and IL-8 being um, associated with these two axes. And um, this, is, this, um, <clears throat> this was previously reported by uh, Biaggi um, et al. in 2010 um, as, as being associated with um, centenarians. And we can see the only centenarian in this data set are 102 year old up here, um, the healthiest person in the um, residential care. And um, also associated with the first axis, we see a decrease in calf circumference and weight. And along the second axis, we see a increase in the geriatric depression test. When we look at the community samples, um, just on their own, we also see this um, decrease in the geriatric depression test. And when we look at the long stay subjects um, only, what we see is as we go from more community type microbiota, as the individuals lose their community type microbiota, there is an increase in, uh, there's a in increase in frailty and a decrease in calf circumference and weight and BMI. If we adjust for food, the association with weight and BMI um, disappears. Um, <clears throat> the, um, from the high diversity microbiota to the lower diversity microbiota, we also see that as you move from high diversity to low diversity, there's an increase in frailty, and there's an also uh, an increase in this inflammatory marker, uh, the C-reactive um, protein, um, high levels of which um, is um, indicative of poor health.
Um, so just to give you an idea of what sort of side, side effects we're dealing with here. Um, so the colors here are the same as the colors here. Um, are the community individuals in the middle, the long stay at either side, high diversity, low, uh, low diversity. And you can see that the blue here are the, are the youngest of the long stay, uh, followed by the cyan, followed by the red, followed by the yellow, um, where the black is the, the gray is the oldest. <clears throat> and so there's, there's about a five-year difference on average between the red here and the yellow here. Just to and when we look at the frailty, what we can see is that even though these people are younger, they've got a higher level of frailty um, than these, these science people over here. Um, the level of frailty, the difference, um, the level of frailty between these is quite similar considering that these individuals are five years older and, um, and the, these people are the, are the most frail. So, uh, when you, so there's, there's, there's an increase in frailty associated with the low diversity microbiota. We also see um, an increase in the C-reactive protein associated with the low diversity microbiota, and um, particularly compared to the high diversity microbiota. So this, uh, these individuals are older than both, um, both the blue and the red here, and yet they have a much lower um, um, level of um, CRP. So, in summary, the microbiota in the elderly is different depending on community location. Uh, this is driven by habitual diet. Microbiota alterations correlate with health changes, especially in the long stay. And so the hypothesis here is that diet shapes gut microbiota, which may impact on health in elderly people. And so we're we're hoping this leads to carefully designed dietary interventions to promote healthier aging. And this is what we're doing as part of the New Age Consortium. So the New Age Consortium um, consists of about 30 different partners in, uh, um, across, um, across Europe and beyond. And um, <clears throat> we're going to look at 1,250 individuals in five different countries, the UK, the Netherlands, France, Italy, and Poland. Half of these individuals will be given a healthy uh, Mediterranean style diet, while half will be just given their regular diet for 12 months. Um, over these, we'll have their microbiota information from before the diet and after, and we'll, we'll be measuring health indices um, throughout, as well as epigenetic um, and um, 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 metabolomic um, data sets. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be um, uh, um, a very interesting um, long-term intervention. Um, my challenges, um, my challenges are micro microbiota modulation and restoration um, in this cohort, and um, the challenges for um, in lots of different cohorts. Um, um, like, and associated with this is the use of prospect, prospective longitudinal study and um, interventions. Um, I would also um, like to echo um, Janet, um, the need for multiple omics data sets to um, really understand um, in a sort of integrative, comprehensive way um, what is happening in the gut microbiota and the generation of dietary guidelines informed by the needs of the microbiota um, as, we, as we age. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Most important bit, uh, acknowledging uh, the people I work with, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, Paul O'Toole and Marcus Clausen. I'd also like to give um, a mention to uh, Mr. Hugh Harris and Dr. Um, Eilish O'Connor. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> this talk is open for questions. In your big European study, you're not going to take the Italians off their Mediterranean diets and put them on British stodgy diets, are you? Um, <laughs> That would be an interesting study, um, but um, so it's, the diet would be formed. So it's 
The diet is going to be formulated specifically for um, elderly individuals, so it's the needs of the elderly are going to be taken in, um, going to be taken into account. So part of the project will be to sort of formulate an elderly type food pyramid, um, and um, and so hopefully we'll be able to improve somewhat on the diet that they are already on. And in yogurt consumption, and whether that was reflected in any changes? Um, the, um, the short answer is there wasn't much difference in yogurt consumption, and uh, we have not been able to identify um, compositional um, changes in the microbiota associated with consumption of yogurts in this data set. Did you look at differences in antibiotic consumption? Um, so antibiotic um, individuals uh, were excluded if they had taken antibiotics a month prior. Um, so although the, although the effects of antibiotic treatment go beyond a month, this, these effects generally um, reflect the sort of increase in antibiotic resistant um, genes and, um, and also maybe a loss of some, um, some species such as uh, Bifidobacterium species are very prone to um, antibiotic treatment and it's known that there's a loss of Bif species in elderly individuals. Um, well, a lot, there's, a lower, there's a, a lowering of the diversity of the Bif species in elderly individuals uh, with the exception of maybe Bifidobacterium and um, <coughs> And so um, I would argue that um, after antibiotic treatment, this sort of new stable microbiota is then the microbiota associated with the individuals. Um, so um, it would be impossible to exclude um, um, every individual that had um, antibiotic treatment um, for a long period of time just due to the prevalence of antibiotic use in our society. Um, by the time someone's treated, they've had multiple courses of antibiotic treatment. Um, so it's no different for the elderly individuals. Um, it, it, would be, it would be a factor that would cause, um, that would destabilize the microbiome, I think, and, um, and um, induce um, some changes in the elderly. Well, please join me in showing appreciation for this speaker. Thank you. Thanks. That was a very interesting talk, and now I'd like to introduce our next talk which will be equally interesting and is in the pediatric realm, which is of interest to many of us here. This is Catherine Dewey, and she is from uh, the University of California at Davis, and will be speaking to us on diet, child nutrition, and the microbiome. Welcome, Dr. Dave, Dr. Dewey.